Congratulations, true crime addicts. We've survived another week. It is Friday, April 12th, 2024. This week, justice at last for Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. Two women disappear in Oklahoma. And somebody's leaving body parts around Jeffrey Dahmer's old hunting grounds. What the hell's going on? All this and more. Uh, stay tuned. Yes. Super excited. We are all pumped to have James Author Renner. James Renner. On. That James Renner has zeroed in. James on. Renner's once again drops a bombshell. Investigative James journalist Renner. reporter James Renner. James Renner, who's been James on the podcast Renner. a long time. Like a local writer. James Renner. James Renner. And welcome back to True Crime This Week with me, your host, James Renner. No relation to Jeremy Renner, as far as I know, although we're two <laughs> uh, handsome men. Um, so, uh, hey, I want to talk to you real quick. If you're a true crime fanatic, if you're a true crime addict, and you're planning to go to CrimeCon, the annual uh, convention for true crime aficionados, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be there. Um, and you should use my code on their website for a discount. Um, it's, you know, it's one of those special things they offer you. So use my discount code RENNER, R-E-N-N-E-R. If you want to spell that backwards, it's also R-E-N-N-E-R. Uh, put it in there, you get a nice little discount. Hope to see you in Nashville in the next month. Uh, and as always, I want to thank Walter, who's back manning the camera after uh, he went to the Cleveland Clinic where he ended up in the ICU after looking at the eclipse. You know, he was warned. I told him not to do that, and he did it anyways. So, uh, but we got him patched up. He's back and, and ready to roll. Let's jump over to those top stories, shall we? Ladies and gentlemen, O.J. Simpson is dead. This is the big news in true crime this week. Uh, just hot off the presses as of Thursday. Did it, did it, did it, did it. This is what everybody's talking about. In related news, dead men can't sue for libel. So let's get into it. A post from OJ's family on X, don't call it Twitter, Thursday morning announced that the juice had died after a long battle with cancer, according to CNN. Now for my Gen Z and Alpha listeners, OJ Simpson was a star football player in the 70s. As a senior running back at USC, O.J. won the Heisman Trophy, which is kind of a big deal if you're into football. Uh, he went on to become a professional football player uh, for the Buffalo Bills and the 49ers. Then he became an actor in a weird way. Uh, he started in these Hertz car rental commercials and then the Naked Gun films. Uh, a, a little fun fact here, he was also offered the role of the Terminator that... Um, Schwarzenegger actually ended up with, but nobody in the in the executive level anyways, nobody could believe that he would actually hurt somebody. So they gave it to Schwarzenegger. Anyways, on the night of June 12th, 1994, man, that's 30 years ago, OJ violently murdered his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend Ron Goldman outside Nicole's condo in Brentwood. Now, uh, O.J. was essentially the only sub suspect from the beginning, and he was scheduled to turn himself into police five days after the murder, but instead he kind of freaked out, jumped into a white Ford Bronco driven by his friend, who was also a football player named Al Cowlings, which resulted in a low-speed police chase down the L.A. highway uh, and, uh, that was broadcast on television. Every, I remember watching that. Everybody was watching it. Cowlings later claimed that O.J. was in the back seat during that chase with a gun threatening to commit suicide uh, if <clears throat> Cowlings didn't drive him back to his home in Brentwood. So O.J. was subsequently arrested and charged with murder. And since he was stupid rich, O.J. put together what they called the dream team of lawyers. He didn't think one lawyer would do it, so he hired like all of them including Johnny Cochran, Robert Shapiro, F. Lee Bailey, and Robert Kardashian. Yes, those Kardashians. That's their father. You have O.J. to thank for the Kardashians. Uh, gross. Um, there was a very public trial, and after the verdict, uh, well, and then the verdict came out. 
The verdict came on October 3rd, 1995. It was watched by 100 million people. The jury found OJ not guilty. I remember being in high school at this time. My biology teacher, Mr. Gilmore, came out of his room and shouted down the hallway that uh, this was a miscarriage of justice. OJ told the press that he would devote his life trying to find the real killer. But since, you know, he knew it was him, he just went to the golf course for a little while. Uh, some semblance of justice came when Ron Goldman's father sued O.J. for wrongful death of his son in civil court. On February 7, 1997, a civil jury found O.J. liable for Ron's death. So he was acquitted in criminal court, but found responsible in civil court. He was ordered to pay $33.5 million in damages, and he was forced to auction off that Heisman trophy. O.J.'s death marks the end of a long and complicated bit of American history. Ron Goldman's father, Fred, is still alive, by the way, and in response to O.J.'s death, he told NBC News, quote, It's no great loss to the world. It's a further reminder of Ron's being gone. It's been two weeks since Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly disappeared in Oklahoma near the Kansas border and police suspect foul play. According to ABC7, Veronica is 27 years old and Jillian is 39. And they were more like acquaintances than friends, but Jillian went with Veronica to pick up Veronica's six-year-old daughter and eight-year-old son from her ex-mother-in-law's place in Ava, Oklahoma. That was on March 30th, and they disappeared along the way. When Veronica didn't show up for the scheduled pickup, her ex-husband allegedly went looking for them, and that's when he found Jillian's car parked off the road near the high school that Veronica had attended when she was a kid. Now, friends have said that Jillian was traveling with Veronica to help with this custody issue. So there's a lot of animosity there between uh, Veronica and her exes and the ex's family. Both Veronica and Jillian are also members of the Hogaton First Christian Church, where Jillian's husband, husband is the preacher. Now, it's kind of not hard to read between the lines of what the press and the police are saying. Everybody hopes that these two women are found safely, but all circumstantial evidence so far suggests otherwise. Also suggests quite a decent suspect, in my opinion. So I imagine we'll be hearing more about that in the coming weeks. A frightening story is developing out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin this week. The former hunting grounds, that is, of Jeffrey Dahmer, that's where he killed all those young men, uh, except for the one he picked up in Bath, Ohio, like a mile down the street here, uh, which was his first one. This, this, this story is a bit complicated at the moment, uh, and as the dude once said, there's a lot of ins and outs, uh, moving parts, but here's the gist. On April 1st, 19-year-old Sade, uh, Sade Carlina Robinson was reported missing to Milwaukee police, according to the journal Sentinel. So this 19-year-old young woman's missing. The next day after she was reported missing, a severed leg was found along the shore of Lake Michigan. On April 4th, the sheriff's department searched a house they said was related to Robinson's disappearance, and they took a person into custody for questioning. A short time later, more human remains were found not far away. DNA testing has not yet been completed, so we don't know for sure that this leg and those other remains are Robinson's, but police seem to be acting under the assumption that they are. The police have taken into custody... Uh, a 33-year-old man named Maxwell Anderson, who the media is naming as a person of interest in Robinson's disappearance. So there's a lot that's still not known. Police claim to have found blood in the stairwell of Anderson's house and on a comforter that's also being tested. Property records show that Anderson is the owner of the house that was searched. He has a criminal record that includes domestic violence charges. It is not known how or if Anderson and Robinson knew each other before her disappearance. She worked at a pizza place. She was not a delivery person. She was the person that was taking the orders over the phone. It's unclear how the severed leg led the police to Anderson's home either. Um, so this is a very new and developing story. 
out of Milwaukee. Expect to hear much more about that in the coming week. Those are the top stories for this week. Um, and uh, I've got lots more coming up after the break. There's some cold case updates. We have to talk about um, Chad Daybell and Dylan, uh, I'm sorry, Dylan Rounds. Lots more to get to. So I'll be back in two and two. Please hang up and try again. And we're back with My Two Dads, starring Stacey Keenan. Police in Utah believe they've recovered the body of Dylan Rounds, a 19-year-old young man who went missing in 2022. Dylan and his grandfather had purchased a farm in Lucene, Utah in 2019, according to NBC News. Dylan spent most nights living in a camper on the farm. The last time anybody heard from him was May 28, 2022, when he spoke to his grandmother on the phone. At the time, a 61-year-old man named James Brenner sometimes helped Dylan bale hay on the farm. Brenner was essentially homeless, squatting inside a camper just a few miles away. Brenner was also a convicted felon, and after Dylan disappeared, police searched his camper, found a firearm and ammunition. In March of 2023, Brenner was charged with criminal homicide for killing Dylan, even though the young body's man, uh, even though the young man's body had not yet been found. It's one of those rare no-body homicide cases that make up like a 0.05% of all cases every year. So it's it's very rare that they do that. But apparently the circumstantial evidence was so overwhelming they were able to charge Brenner. Uh, however, police noted that during the search for Dylan, they discovered a pair of boots with a blood stain on it. They tested that blood for DNA and were surprised to find that it was a mixture of both Dylan and James Brenner's DNA. And then on Tuesday, police announced that they found skeletal remains in a remote area of Box Elder County. When reached for comment by East Idaho News, Dylan's mother said that Brennan had given up the location of her son's body as part of a plea deal. So he's likely to get a lesser charge um, at sentencing because he told them where the body was. So that kind of wraps up that case against uh, Brenner, I guess. Um, unfortunate conclusion to that cold case story. Chad Daybell's trial started this week. You probably remember this guy. Chad is the author of several books that predict a coming apocalypse based on the beliefs of the Church of Latter-day Saints, uh, which is the Mormon Church. He hooked up with a woman named Lori Vallow, and if you remember the news from back then, they kind of disappeared and were found vacationing in Hawaii when Lori's two kids were missing. It was very odd. Chad and Lori were both married when their affair began, but their spouses died quickly under mysterious circumstances, according to the Associated Press. Lori came to believe that her children were zombies and needed to be killed to save their souls. Daybell is on trial for the murders of his wife and Lori's two children. Lori was convicted last year and sentenced to life without parole. Daybell faces the death penalty if convicted, which, unless there's one crazy juror, he most likely will be. James and Jennifer Crumbly, the parents of 15-year-old Ethan Crumbly, who shot four students to death at Oxford High School in Michigan in 2021, were sentenced on Tuesday after being convicted of man's laughter. I'm sorry, that's manslaughter. For their role in providing <laughs> their son with guns and not interfering before the mass shooting. I know this is a serious story. It's one of those that just drives me crazy. Um, and I'm happy to see that the police are and prosecutors are taking that extra step to charge the parents in these cases. This is, a, this is the first of its kind, but likely not to be the last, where they're starting to hold the parents accountable for these mass shootings at United States high schools. So... Um, I'm, I'm kind of happy about this predicament uh, and, and the results of this week anyways. James and Jennifer will serve 10 to 15 years in prison. Jennifer apologized and expressed grief, but warned, quote, This could be any parent up here in my shoes. Ethan could be you, your child, your grandchild, your niece, your nephew. Your child could make a fatal decision, not just with a gun, but with a knife or vehicle. Maybe. 
but you know, it's much less, less successful if their parents didn't buy them uh, a semi-automatic handgun. Most likely they're going to be stopped if they come at you with a knife uh, and they're not going to get as far with a vehicle. Uh, there's just, you know, I don't know if I buy that argument. Um, so first of its kind, the parents are going away. More details were revealed this week in the shooting death of 26-year-old Dexter Reed Jr., which occurred in Chicago on March 21st. Reed was shot to death by police after a traffic stop, according to CNN. Police claim that Reed fired first. Now, body camera footage has revealed some important details about this incident. Footage shows that the police were dressed in plain clothes and hooded jackets when they approached Reed's vehicle, drew guns, and demanded he open the, the uh, car doors. What would you do in that situation? These people don't look like police. They're yelling and pointing guns at you. They're in hoodies. So, anyways, police fired 96 bullets at this young man over a period of 41 seconds. Now count that out if you're interested. 41 seconds. See how long that is. It's, 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 it's a long time. It's a long time. Why did police pull Reed over to begin with? He was selling drugs, right? I mean, or human trafficking, something serious, right? No, he, uh, he wasn't wearing his seatbelt. So safe travels, everybody. Let's jump over to weird news. A French woman who traveled to northern Italy on a ghost hunting trip has been found dead in an abandoned church. And according to an article in Business Insider, her body was drained of blood. I've seen this movie before. The 22-year-old unnamed woman was stabbed to death before her body was drained, according to police. They want to know if her murder was part of some kind of sacrificial ritual. According to witnesses, the woman was accompanied on her trip by a man, and both were dressed up as vampires. One theory the detectives are considering seriously is that her death may have been a consented murder where she helped plan it. I don't know. That motive seems a little batty to me. I'll, I'll see myself out. Uh, jumping over to pop culture. The new Netflix true crime documentary movie, What Jennifer Did, premiered on Wednesday. This one tells the, the true story of a young woman named Jennifer Pan who survived a home invasion that left her mother dead and her father injured, only to become the prime suspect. This documentary is short and crazy and resolved by the end. It's a good watch if you're like folding clothes or like doing housework, some spring cleaning. Just put it on the background, see what everybody's talking about. And uh, the featured book of the week is right here on the shelf. It's called Prescription for Pain. It's by uh, journalist Philip Isle. Here's the write-up. It just came out this week, by the way, like, like Tuesday. So it's brand new. Check it out. Give it some reviews. Uh, it needs some reviews on Goodreads and Amazon. And it's, it's an important book, I think. Here's the write-up. This haunting and propulsive debut follows a journalist's years-long investigation into his father's old classmate, a former high school valedictorian, Paul Volkman, who once seemed destined for greatness after earning his MD and his PhD from the prestigious University of Chicago, but is now serving four consecutive life sentences at a federal prison in Arizona. Volkman was the center figure in a massive pill mill scheme in southern Ohio. His pain clinics accepted only cash, employed armed guards, and dispensed a tor torrent of opiate opioid painkillers, and other controlled substances. For three years, Volkman remained in business despite raids by law enforcement and complaints from patients' family members. Prosecutors would ultimately link him to the overdose dose, dose deaths of 13 patients, though investigators explored his ties to at least 20 other deaths. This groundbreaking book is based on 12 years of correspondence and interviews with Volkman, the journalist and author also traveled to 19 states, interviewed 150 people. There's lots and lots of um, 
documents and evidence to back up everything in this book, it's, like I said, I think it's kind of important. The American opioid epidemic is, like this book, a true crime story. Through this one doctor's story, an era of unfathomable tragedy is brought down to a tangible and devastating human scale. So if you like uh, Dope Sick and uh, all those movies about the Sacklers, give this book a read. Uh, that is the show for this week, folks. It is the weekend. It's starting to feel like spring. Go out there, do some gardening, get, get your mulch down. Now's the time to prune fruit trees. And as the incomparable Murray Saul, the godfather of Cleveland radio once said, we got to, 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 get down, damn it. True Crime This Week is a fearful symmetry production. Photo and artwork are licensed through Shutterstock. If you like the cut of my jib, I have another podcast you might enjoy called The Philosophy of Crime, in which I attempt to solve the big questions behind our true crime obsession by looking to philosophy for answers. Thank you for listening. I'll see you next week. Sit, Brownie, sit. Good dog.